This screencast is about how the tables in the lab manual work in the PC-131 lab manual. As you go through this document, you'll learn what the different lab manual tables are for and how to fill them in. The lab manual is set up so that the tables form a kind of a template that can be used for any experiment. So in any kind of experiment you do, there's certain kinds of information that you record, so the lab manual tables are set up to sort of make that generic so you can understand how you would record the information that you want to record from any experiment. For instance, every quantity in an experiment needs to be identified. Every instrument used for the measurements needs to be identified and every experimental factor which potentially introduces uncertainty into the experiment needs to be identified. The lab manual has several tables to include all of this information. So for quantities, every quantity in an experiment is either a constant that is given in advance or it's something that's measured or it's something that's calculated from other quantities. There are two tables that contain this information. The first table is this one which shows non-calculated quantities. So, this keeps track of the quantity, the symbol. The symbol can be one that is given in the lab manual or can be one that I create. It also keeps track of whether this particular quantity is measured once, measured multiple times, or whether it's a constant that's given. So for instance, if we had the quantity height, we would fill in the symbol. If there was a symbol in the lab manual, then we could put a G for given. If I had to make up one myself, I'd put an M for mine. And here, if this is something that is measured once, we could put an S for single. If it's something that we measure multiple times, we put an R for repeated. Or if it's a constant that's given, we put a C. For every quantity that's calculated, there is a symbol, which is going to be used for it in the manual or in a report, an equation saying how it's calculated, and an uncertainty equation to calculate the uncertainty based on the uncertainties in all the quantities involved. Again, it makes sense to have a table just for this information. So this table of calculated quantities, so for instance, we fill in the first thing. Suppose the first quantity we have is the acceleration due to gravity, and we can fill in the symbol g. We fill in the equation for g, and then we fill in the equation for the uncertainty in G. There's information that we need for every instrument that we use. We need to know the name of the instrument, the units it uses, the precision measure of the instrument, which will affect the measurements that come from it, if there's a zero error associated with that instrument, then we need to record that as well. If the same instrument's going to be used for many different experiments, if we can put all of this information in a table, then we don't have to repeat this information in every experiment. So here we have the table that's made to contain reference information for instruments that get used in multiple ex experiments. So we have a reference number, we have the name of the instrument, we have its precision measure, we have its units. We also have a column for the range. So for instance, we have a measuring instrument such as the stopwatch. The precision measure we can determine by looking at the stopwatch. The units also will determine by looking at it. For some instruments, it's good to know the range because for future reference we can tr keep track of what range of values we can measure with this instrument. It's good to have, but it's not essential. This reference means that if I use this 
stopwatch in multiple experiments, instead of typing in the name, say stopwatch each time, I can just say A1 in the table. When we have uncertainties, every experimental factor which potentially produces uncertainty needs to include a few things. It needs to include the quantity affected by it, a description of the experimental factor itself, an estimated bound, which means a number on how big this uncertainty would be, and an indication of whether this uncertainty will be random or systematic. If it's random, then it means sometimes it will affect our value in one direction, other times it would affect it in the other direction. If it's systematic, then it will always affect our results in a particular direction. How we can reduce the uncertainty will depend on whether it's random or systematic. If it's random, then if we repeat the measurements multiple times, then the uncertainty should be reduced, it should average out. If it's systematic, then we can try and calibrate for that. If we can try and determine the size of the uncertainty, then we can correct for it. So again, we have a table for this information. So. If we have some factor which affects, say, the height, then we put in the symbol H for the height. The name of the factor is, in this case, for instance, the bend in the tape measure. That's a description of the uncertainty factor. It's systematic because the bend means our measurements of the height will always be bigger than they should be. Based on how much bend there is, we can estimate a bound and then estimate units, or include our units. So, there are certain quantities that are only measured once, or are given, and so we have a table just for those quantities. So the table includes the symbol, which is used for the quantity, the value of the quantity, the units that it's are associated with it. And in addition, if it's a measured quantity, then it needs to contain the information about the measuring instrument used. So the name of the instrument, the precision measure, the zero error if it's applicable, and the effect of uncertainty if there's some experimental factor that actually makes the, the real uncertainty bigger than the precision measure. So here's what that table looks like. So again, if we measure the height once, then H is the symbol. Fill in the instrument we use. Now we could say tape measure here, or if we filled the tape measure in that other table, we could fill in the reference. So for instance, A1. Clicking on this button will take you to that table. Fill in the value for the height here, and the units engine measure, which will also be recorded in this table if this has been used elsewhere. Zero error, if there is any. And if there's an effect of uncertainty that's bigger than the precision measure, then we fill it in here, the value. And again, if we have something here, then we also need an entry in this other table, so this button will get us, take us there. So for certain kinds of tables, each experiment will have experiment-specific tables for things that are measured multiple times. So for instance, in the Measuring G experiment, we're going to have multiple trials of one experiment, so we have a table just for that. Now you'll notice that this table includes a section at the top for the instrument used with all the information we've said before, the name or the reference, the units, the precision measure, and the zero error if applicable. There's an area for the measurements themselves. There's an area for quantities that are calculated in the lab. For instance, with multiple trials, we'll only the average in the lab. Notice that this section up here actually has some things to fill in. These, these parentheses with nothing in between means there's something to be filled in, so watch for ta areas like that in tables. And the areas in gray like this 
are for quantities that are going to be filled in after the lab is complete. In the case of this table, for statistical quantities, then again, we have an area for measurements, and then we have an area for calculated values. There's also going to be more calculated values down here. To summarize all of this, for any experiment, many of the same things need to be recorded. There are some things that need to be recorded in the lab, and some can be determined later. And having these generic tables for many of these things helps to make it consistent from experiment to experiment.